on World News Tonight. Greece ablaze. Greece battles Europe's largest wildfire ever recorded as it continues to spiral out of control. Sentence suspended. Pakistani courts suspend former Prime Minister Imran Khan's graft conviction sentence. Closed format. Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin buried in closed format in a private funeral in St. Petersburg. And sleeping on your feet. Standing sleeping pods are coming to Tokyo Cafe, promising to relieve fatigue and stress. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now we begin tonight with uncertainty over Pakistan's court rules as the Pakistani court has suspended the former Prime Minister Imran Khan's recent conviction on corruption charges, though it is unclear whether this will lead to his release from jail. A Pakistani court has suspended former Prime Minister Imran Khan's recent conviction on corruption charges, but the decision will not lead to his release as a judge has ordered his detention in another case on charges of leaking state secrets. His lawyer, Naeem Panjuta, announced the news on social media on Tuesday, saying the sentence has been suspended. 70-year-old former cricket hero Khan has been at the center of political turmoil since his ouster in a parliamentary vote of confidence in April 2022. His relations with Pakistan's powerful generals have deteriorated ever since. Khan was imprisoned on August 5th. He'd been sentenced to three years in jail for unlawfully selling state gifts during his tenure as prime minister from 2018 to 2022. His legal team had lodged an appeal on the grounds that he was convicted without being given the right to defend himself. As a result of the conviction and with a national election expected soon, Pakistan's Election Commission has also barred Khan from contesting elections for five years. The remaining charge against Khan alleges he made public the contents of a confidential cable sent by Pakistan's ambassador to the United States and used it for political gain. Khan says the cable proves his removal was at the behest of the United States which he said pressed Pakistan's military to topple his government because he had visited Russia shortly before its attack on Ukraine. Both the United States and the Pakistani military deny this. Now, in a significant breakthrough, the Pragyan rover of the Chandrayaan-3 mission has unambiguously confirmed the presence of sulfur in the moon's surface near the South Pole. India's space agency stated that India's moon rover confirmed the presence of sulphur and detected several other elements near the lunar south pole as it searches for signs of frozen water nearly a week after its historic moon landing. The rover's laser-induced spectroscope instrument also detected aluminium, iron, calcium, chromium, titanium, manganese, oxygen and silicon on the lunar surface. The lunar rover had come down on a ramp from the ladder of India's spacecraft after touchdown near the moon's south pole. The Chandrayaan 3's rover is expected to conduct experiments over 14 days. The rover is searching for signs of frozen water that could help future astronaut missions as a potential source of drinking water or to make rocket fuel. The rover also will study the moon's atmosphere and seismic activity. Craft moves at a slow speed of around 10 centimeters or 4 inches per second to minimize shock and damage to the vehicle from the moon's rough terrain. The successful mission showcases India's rising standing as a technology and space powerhouse and dovetails with the image that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is trying to protect. An country asserting its place among the global elite. The mission began more than a month ago at an estimated cost of $75 million. India's success came just days after Russia's Luna 25, which was aiming for the same lunar region, spun into an uncontrolled orbit and crashed. India is planning its first mission to the International Space Station next year in collaboration with the United States. A forest blaze in Greece is the largest wildfire ever recorded in the EU. The block is mobilising nearly half its firefighting air wing to tackle it. A wildfire burning in northeastern Greece for 11 days has destroyed an area larger than New York City. That's according to the European Union-backed Copernicus Climate Change Service on Tuesday. Fueled by gale force winds and hot weather, the fire that began near the city of Alexandroupolis quickly spread across the Evros region. It killed at least 20 people last week, making it Europe's deadliest blaze this summer. A European Commission spokesperson outlined the body's relief efforts. 
So most notably in Greece's Alexandropolis region, we are facing the largest wildfire uh, ever recorded um, in the EU. In this context, we have mobilized 12 um, aircraft uh, from our rescue fleet together with over 400 firefighters and 60 vehicles. Aircraft and hundreds of firefighters from Serbia, Slovakia, the Czech Republic and Albania are battling the flames. This is Czech commander Yiri Nemcic. It's very difficult according to the temperature, uh, wind uh, and uh, uh, size or the, the space where the uh, fire is. So it's on 100 meters and uh, it's, uh, the development of, of the fire is very dynamic, so it's very dangerous. The flames have turned swathes of lush greenery into scorched earth and destroyed homes and livelihoods. The Copernicus Emergency Management Service said the fire had raged over 310 square miles at least, and New York City takes up 300.5 square miles. All but one of the dead are presumed to have been migrants who crossed over from Turkey. Authorities fear more bodies may be found when the flames are put out, as Evros is a popular crossing into the EU for thousands of migrants and refugees each year. Summer wildfires are common in Greece, but the government says extreme weather conditions, which scientists linked to climate change, have made them worse this year. And now over in Russia, where Wagner Mercery Group Chief Yevgeny Prigozhin was buried in a private funeral. The ceremony in his hometown of St. Petersburg was carried out without military honours. This despite Prigozhin being given Russia's highest military award, the hero of Russia, for leading Wagner forces in Ukraine. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Russian mercenary leader, was buried in St. Petersburg on Tuesday, six days after the unexplained private jet crash that is believed to have killed him. And Secrecy surrounding the arrangements for the closed funeral meant it could not be turned into a large-scale show of support for the man whose massive mutiny in June amounted to the largest ever threat to President Vladimir Putin's rule. Putin did not attend the ceremony, according to the Kremlin. Cameras briefly captured this footage from the cemetery, which was under heavy security, before two unidentified mourners ordered them to stop recording. Russian authorities have not said why the plane crashed, and the Kremlin has rejected speculation that Putin ordered Prigozhin's death over the mutiny as a, quote, absolute lie. Villagers living near the crash site told at the time that they heard a loud bang before seeing the plane fall. The plane model had a good safety record, and only one incident in two decades of flying, which was not related to mechanical issues. This is the last known video of Prigozhin, said to have been filmed in Africa and released just days before the incident. The crash killed him and other top members of his private military company, Wagner Group, along with the plane's crew. It's not clear what will happen to the group now, which appears to be leaderless. Following Japan's Fukushima wastewater release, tensions between China and Japan are heating up to a point where Tokyo is hinting that it'll file a complaint to the World Trade Organization against Beijing's seafood import bans. Beijing's decision to ban all the seafood imports from Japan has prompted Tokyo to threaten to take Beijing to the World Trade Organization in order to seek a reversal. Japan's Foreign Minister Yoshi Hayashi on Tuesday said that Japan will take necessary action under various rules, including the WTO framework. On the same day, Beijing's Foreign Ministry spokesperson urged Japan to take concrete action. In response to the Japanese side's extremely selfish and irresponsible wrong action, China and other parties at stake have the right and responsibility to take legitimate, reasonable and necessary precautionary measures to safeguard marine environment safety, food security and people's health. In China, demand for seafood already appears to be falling, putting those in the fishing industry in a tough situation. Outraged Chinese citizens have been dialing the numbers of Japanese businesses and institutions to complain about the release. In the four days following the start of the discharge, more than 6,000 calls were made to the Tokyo Electric Power Company, while 220 calls were made to police stations across Japan. Japan has also reportedly made phone calls with complaints to the Chinese embassy and consulates, something the Chinese embassy says seriously disrupts the normal operation of their offices. 
Flights to Japan from China have decreased by a third over the past week, and more people with flights booked are demanding refunds. According to Japanese media outlets, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will likely address the issue at the ASEAN meeting and G20 summit next month. There, he is expected to engage in dialogue with participating countries and reiterate that the wastewater discharge meets international safety standards. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Tonight's Road to the White House now as Miami Mayor Francis Suarez announced that he was suspending his long shot bid for the White House after failing to gain momentum in the crowded Republican field. The Miami mayor was unable to garner meaningful support in the polls and ultimately fell short of the Republican National Committee's polling requirement to make it onto the first debate stage, a benchmark he previously said should be a make or break for presidential campaigns. The only Hispanic candidate in the Republican primary race, Suarez launched his campaign in June with relatively little national name recognition. In dropping out, he pledged to continue to amplify the voices of the Hispanic community and called on other members of his party to do the same. His qualifications for the White House also came into question after he was caught unaware by an interviewer's question about alleged human rights abuses in China against the Uyghurs, a Muslim minority in the western region of Xinjiang. Suarez is the first candidate to exit the Republican primary race, which has also far been dominated by Trump, despite the former president's growing list of legal charges. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un refers to the leaders of South Korea, the US and Japan as gang bosses. Despite his comment, Washington remains open to holding dialogue with the reclusive state. Earlier this week, North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency reported that its leader Kim Jong-un slammed the leaders of South Korea, the US and Japan, calling them gang bosses for agreeing to regularize their joint military exercises. However, despite Kim's comments, Washington says it remains open to dialogue with Pyongyang. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said Tuesday that the U.S. has said on many occasions that they're open to dialogue with the reclusive state, and it remains true even now. Despite the U.S.'s openness to hold talks with Pyongyang, South Korean ambassador to the United States Choi Yun-dong said Tuesday during a forum hosted by the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies that the opportunity for reopening dialogue with North Korea is not likely for the time being. Joe also reiterated South Korean President Yoon sung yeols stance that the continued provocations from Pyongyang will only strengthen the trilateral security cooperation between the three countries. Meanwhile, during the same event, the U.S. National Security Council coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs, Kurt Campbell, highlighted the three allies' commitment to institutionalizing their three-way cooperation. Campbell stressed that what was seen in the Camp David summit was a sense of three equal, powerful, committed, determined nations meeting on equal terms, noting that no country is weaker or stronger in the alliance. However, he also said the trilateral cooperation cannot be future-proof given the historical differences between South Korea and Japan being the major source of conflict between the two neighboring countries. Protests against the Syrian regime continued in the southern city of Suweida for the ninth day as shots were fired by security forces to intimidate protesters in nearby Shahba. With chants of Bashar is a traitor, members of the Druze religious minority group have sparked an uprising that is spreading across southern Syria. As protests in the province of Suweda enter a second week, the France 24 observers have verified telegram videos of demonstrations cropping up in other provinces, like these rallies Monday night in the rebel-held Idlib province. Also in the city of Jassim, under government control, where for years it was unthinkable for people to risk their own safety and call for the end of Bashar al-Assad's regime. Our only demand is the peaceful transfer of authority so we get rid of this ruling gang without any sedition or bloodshed. 
Please go away, Assad. The matter is over. A government decision to end gasoline subsidies sparked the protests more than a week ago, a harsh economic blow to many Syrians who were already struggling to make ends meet. Assad blames the economic woes on Western sanctions, but many Syrians have been quick to channel their anger directly at him, even tearing down images of his face from public buildings. We are all united. No flag can divide us, no sect or religion can divide us. All of us Syrians are united. We won't accept anything less than the fall of the regime. In Dara province, which returned to government control five years ago, people have joined the protests against Assad. It was the cradle of the 2011 uprising, before peaceful protests there were violently suppressed, leading to a bloody crackdown by Assad and a civil war that has killed hundreds of thousands of Syrians and displaced millions more. The French education minister's proposal to prohibit students from wearing abayas, full-length robes worn by some Muslim women, has been welcomed on the right as a move to protect France's secularist traditions. But it has divided the left over whether the garment is a cultural or religious symbol, or just a fashion statement that the state should not be involved in policing. The French government is moving forward with a decision to ban students from wearing the style of dress called an abaya in public schools. And it's drawn debate over where the line is between culture, fashion and religion. An abaya is a type of loose, full-length robe chosen by some Muslim women. France already had a ban on children wearing religious symbols in public schools to uphold its strict brand of secularism, known as laïcité. But it's struggled to update guidelines as its Muslim population grows. In 2004, France banned headscarves from schools. The latest move on abayas was met with applause from the country's right, but some academics warn it could be counterproductive, especially as it touches on clothing they say is worn for fashion or identity rather than religion. France's ban on religious symbols in schools has both supporters and critics across the political spectrum and is a sensitive subject. Some say that to differentiate between fashion and religion could lead to pupils being profiled based on their identity. De Jeanette is studying to be a teacher, so she wasn't comfortable with giving her last name. But she says she wears the dress at home and doesn't understand why it was banned. It has no distinct religious symbol. I think the abaya has no religious symbol. It's just like wearing a dress, but that dress has a name. It's like wearing a flower printed dress. I wouldn't tell you, you're wearing that dress, you can't be here. It's just like any other clothing. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The suspect of the UNC fatal shooting was charged with first-degree murder. The motive behind the murder still remains a mystery. Police in northeastern Brazilian state of Bahia killed two men and arrested another who was suspected to be involved in the murder of nine people in the town of Mata de São João. Police had found two parents and two children dead inside a home in Texas in an apparent murder-suicide. The family also had recently held a funeral for a child who had drowned. Three girls that once belonged to Princess Diana are hitting the auction block. They had been auctioned off before by Diana in 1997 for charity. A group of senior Gabonese military officers confirmed that they have seen power in Gabon. They appeared on national television minutes after the state election body announced President Ali Bongo had won a third term. And that is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We are leaving you tonight in Tokyo, where giraffe pods or standing sleeping pods are being installed at a cafe in Harajuku district. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.